Hello and welcome. It's John here from It's More Than Just Gaming.com, and today I'm going to be doing an unboxing of a Game of Thrones Living Card Game Chapter Pack. In this case, it's going to be the Red Wedding. Uh, so let's get on with it. So we start with the start cards. Uh, we've got Daisy Mormont. Uh, and the Winterfell Archery Range. Daisy Mormont is a four gold uh, character who has the martial and power icons with strength X, uh, which is pricey, but when you look at it, she has the renown ability, which means she gains power anytime she succeeds in a challenge, and X is the number of start characters you control. So she'll start off weak and she'll become incredibly powerful as you get more and more characters out. Um, so. For actually for four gold if you've got even uh, four or five other start characters out she's got to be incredibly powerful um, so I can definitely see her getting some usage in a Stark deck um, although something like the wildfire plot which will destroy most of your army would probably actually cripple uh, her card or at least slow her down for a while but then that's true of quite a lot of decks anyway uh, the Winterfell Archery Range, during a martial challenge, kneel the Winterfell Archery Range to choose a participating character with strength 3 or lower and remove it from the challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. Not brilliant, but not terrible either. It's relatively cheap, 2 gold. Um, it could be the difference in a uh, contest. It might also be removing someone that's only in the challenge because they've got an effect that is useful like insight. So I can see this going into a Stark deck, but is the definitely the less powerful of the two cards and the, the less potent of the two cards as far as I'm concerned for the Stark cards. After with Starks, we have the Tyrell cards. Uh, the first one is the Old Town Informer, a two gold... A character for the Tyrells. It's a loyal character. It has Strength 2 and Intrigue, which isn't bad. Um, it has Ambush 2, so you can play it directly from your hand for 2 gold in the challenges phase, and Bestow 3, um, which basically means you can put 3 gold on it uh, when you play it. The reaction... Uh, after card enters played during the challenges phase, draw X cards, then discard X cards. So actually, not a particularly brilliant card on the field. I mean, it's okay for your intrigue, and Tyrells live on intrigue. Um, it's not bad for getting trash out of your hand and cycling through your deck. Um, and actually, if you think your opponent's going to be doing that a lot, that uh, ability to discard and replenish uh, would proc again as well. Um, and playing it as an ambush, you would get that straight away. Um, the second card is, again, Loyal House Redwine Arbor Vineyard. It's a two-cost uh, land, limited, so you can only play one limited per turn. Um, and as a marshalling action, you can kneel the Arbor Vineyard to gain one gold, which is good. Uh, but it's two gold if there are more summer plot cards than winter plot cards. Um, I guess then you would probably have this... Um, in your deck if you had predominantly summer plot cards and hopefully there's no Starks opposite you with a deck full of winter plot cards or something like that. Um, still pretty good even if you're only getting the one gold because it's it's a persistent effect. You can do it every turn. Two gold at the start, one gold every turn after that so I can't complain. Can see me definitely using the Arbor Vineyard, probably using the Old Town Informer but I'd need to have a few play tests first I think. On to the Night's Watch. I've been wanting to put together a pretty solid Night's Watch deck for a while and have not been able to because it's always been uh, too expensive and not enough gold. Um, Othel Yarwick's the first one, a six gold builder, a loyal character with challenge icons of power and intrigue and strength five. Uh, quite pricey, but quite potent as well. And his action, Neil uh, Night's Watch location to choose a Night's Watch character. And until the end of the phase, they get a challenge icon of your choice. Okay, that's very good. Uh, because that means you've got... Um, oh, you're adaptable to whatever deck or opponent you're up against. If you think you're going to get hammered by Marshall, then Neil a location. And give Othel Yarrick uh, Marshall... Um, icon. If you think you're going to get intrigued by the Lannisters, then give someone else an intrigue icon. The second item in the Night's Watch uh, cards that you get this time round is a fortification, which is a zero cost 
attachment basically to a land which has an interrupt when attached location would leave place sacrificed improve fortifications to save it um i'm trying to remember what sort of cards make locations leave play but given that the night's watch deck that i'm looking at building would have a fair amount of locations i can see this being used to protect the most valuable ones um particularly if the locations can be knelt to do things uh, like Othel Yarrick's ability uh, but i'd need to actually have a look at the night's watch cards a little bit more detail to know just exactly how useful that is it looks useful and it's free but it's also taking up space in your deck so uh not quite sure or not yet i can see it having use but i st i need to do more studies on the night's watch deck Probably the one deck that I have the least experience with is the Baratheon deck. So here are the Baratheon cards. Um, we've got Saraxo Florent. Um, he's a House Florent Knight. Uh, he costs four. He has martial and power icons and he's strength four. So a fairly solid basic card. He has bestow three, so you can put your three gold on him. And after you win a challenge which he's participating, discard one gold and you kneel a character without attachments. The one thing I do remember about the Baratheon deck is it's all about kneeling your opponents so that they can't do anything. It's basically about uh, keeping them... St um, in check i guess um saving the kingdom is an event uh that costs two which is basically on the same theme choose and nail a character with strength three or lower that that character cannot stand during the standing phase this round so you're effectively um crippling one of the cards for two turns this round this turn and the next turn uh, that can be quite useful because there are quite a few weak strength cards that have useful abilities that people tend to play so for instance in my lannister deck i might have grand maester Pycelle. Uh, he's only strength two if i recall but he has insight which means he has draw power so this would be useful for making him kneel um and there are obviously plenty of other cards where that applies not bad either one of them uh, and a fairly solid uh martial and power card in sir axel florent anyway and in keeping with the main theme of the baratheon deck that i've encountered on to everyone's favorite enemies the lannisters first we have a cost to event tywin stratagem which is a loyal event um in the challenges action you spend two gold and choose characters with printed cost two or lower controlled by each player return each of the characters to its owner's hand so that's not bad for clearing the field of weaker characters in preparation for a martial challenge or something that uh, forces a player to kill characters um, and bec because you can actually put it back into your hand at the cost of one gold and reuse it it's not a bad little card there um, I think it's more useful when you've got multiple opponents in the melee style game rather than a joust but still not too bad at all then you've got Sir Osmond Kettleback um, a cost four strength three Kingsguard Knight with power and martial so fairly solid but um, I think his strength is in the fact that he's got bestow three, which means he starts with up to three gold on him, however much you want, one to three. And once a challenge phase, you can discard one gold from Sir Osmond Kettleback to put a knight character into play. Now, I don't have many Lannister knights. I have Sir Osmond Kettleback, I have Jamie Lannister, and I have Sir Gregor Clegane. And that is why I kind of like this ability. I look because Gregor Clegane's expensive, but he's a strength ten knight, and I love the idea that suddenly he can just ambush from my hand at the cost of one gold from Osmond Kettleback. I can imagine that causing panic um, in opposing players in a particular game when suddenly the mountain that rides is on the field. The only problem is he goes into the discard pile at the end of the turn, but well maybe you've got more than one copy of him in your uh, deck so i quite like that truthfully though i don't have sir osmond in my deck maybe i should now we're on to the grey joys i love these cards first of all we have the silences crew which the silence is your own grey joys ship it costs four it is strength four and it has martial and power no intrigue but then grey joys are weak on that it counts as a raider and it has bestow three no attachments and pillage uh, so it can have up to three gold on it and when it wins a challenge you discard a card from the opponent's pile and it gets plus two strength for every gold it has and after the silence crew discards a location or attachment using pillage place one gold from the treasury on silence's crew that 
crew is going to become very powerful very quickly, I think, over a couple of turns. And it works really well with bl plunder. Nail your fact and costs nothing. Nail your faction card to choose an opponent. Gain one gold for each location and attachment in that player's discard pile. If you've been pillaging with Silence's crew and other Greyjoy cards that do pillage, um, and the other player still has money left, plunder's amazing because then suddenly that gold they were saving up to play their schemes or to win dominance with, suddenly that's all yours. I love these cards. They work very well together, and they are both in my Greyjoy deck. I'm not massively familiar with the Targaryen deck, but these are a particular. Uh, I can see where these two cards come in quite useful. Breaker of Chains, a two, uh, a cost two attachment, and it's a title. Uh, attached character gets one plus strength for each character you control with printed cost two or lower. So I can see that you're building a, a slave deck basically. So you get lots and lots of slaves on the field, and suddenly the Breaker of Chains is very powerful. And after each. After attached character is declared as an attacker, put a character with printed cost 2 or lower into play from your hand. Um, so you only get more powerful so long as you have sufficient cards. That's amazing. And then you've got Strong Belwas. Uh, bestow 2. It's uh, cost 3. He has the martial icon and he is strength 4. So he's very cheap for a strong character. And he has an interrupt that when another unique uh, Targaryen character would be killed, discard one goal. From strong, Belwas to, from strong Belwas to save it. So you can bodyguard them a little bit, uh, unless it's something like Wildfire, which says cannot be saved. But still, that is a pretty powerful bodyguard style card and the Breaker of Chains. Uh, if you've got plenty of cheap character cards in your hand, um, to make your sort of like your slave deck, then yeah, you're gonna make one person stupidly powerful. Although that'll become vulnerable to. Oh, actually, what would that become vulnerable to? Not sure. The sea stone chair of the Greyjoys um, can only target things that are that have no attachments. Yeah. Okay. You're putting all your eggs in one basket, though. So there is a risk involved, but um, you dominate the field for a little while, I would think. On to the last of the great houses, in this case it's uh, the Martells. Uh, the first card you have is Illyria Sand, um, uh, cost 4, strength 4, bastard and companion with intrigue and power icons and bestow 3. Uh, reaction after you lose a challenge in which Illyria Sand is participating, discard 1 gold from her to stand each bastard character you control. Now again, not massively familiar with the Martell deck, but I believe its bonuses, it tends to get its most strength when it's reacting to things, when it's not player 1. So I can see this being quite useful, um, someone's coming at you for a power or an intrigue attack, and you put Illyria Sand in to block them, and maybe you don't actually succeed, and maybe you try not to succeed actually, but they don't get their uncontested thing. You do stop some of it, it's, no, it's not uncontested, and then suddenly you stand everything that joined her in attack. So when it comes around to uh, the Martell's turn, Illyria Sand and all of the bastards in your force are ready to do their attack. Then you have Secret Schemes, which is a cost one event, um, nail your faction card and draw X cards, where X is the number of used plot cards. Okay, that's a good card any time you play it during the game. I mean, w paying one gold e even in turn, well, I guess it'd be turn two, that you c is the first time you can use it, is still drawing one card. But then turn three and turn four, you're drawing two or three cards and so on. That's really useful if you're desperately trying to seek out that one card that you need. For instance, maybe you've got in there somewhere the Red Viper of Dorne and you've got enough money. You know you've got enough money to do it, but you just can't find them. So yeah, I can definitely see that being used. They're both pretty good cards, actually. I like both of them. And when I get round to building a Martell deck, um, I think both of them will actually make their way into it. With a name like the Red Wedding, you would assume there'd be some phrase in this deck, and you'd be right, the neutral cards you get are all phrase. Let's look at the middle one first, Walder Frey. Cost 6, has all three challenge icons, and is strength 3, so very, very pricey. He has Renown, which means he gets power every time he succeeds in a challenge, so that is good. However, here's why Walder Frey is an awesome character in the game. While Walder Frey is attacking, each other House Frey character you control is also considered to be attacking, so they might not be attacking, but you get their strength as well. That's fantastic. 
Um, you then have the Frey Bastard, which is two gold, has Intrigue and Power Strength, one bestow two. After you win a challenge in which uh, the Frey Bastard, uh, or which you control two or more attacking house Frey characters, discard one gold from Frey Bastard and gain one power for your faction. So another way for your faction to gain power. Uh, so that's pretty useful. And then there is the event Frey Hospitality. Now I love this. Uh, reaction after you win a challenge in which you control an attacking house Frey character if it was the third challenge you initiated in this phase choose and kill a character controlled by the losing opponent choose and kill three characters instead if you won by 20 or more strength so the phrase it's all about the third challenge uh, there is a, an agenda to do with the tower uh, the twins which gives you advantages on your third challenge um, and it's all about overwhelming force because they always said Walder Frey was the only man in the Seven Kingdoms who could field an army from his own britches. I can definitely see myself making a separate Lannister deck built around Walder Frey uh, and as many Frey characters as I can get in there um, and the Frey hospitality because that's just immense. I love that. And Yeah, definitely. Bit pricey, but I think definitely worth it in the long run. And the final card that we have in this deck, which you do get three copies of, is the one plot available, the Red Wedding itself, um, which at a first glance looks very weak, but of course it's not. You get four gold for playing this particular plot, your initiative is zero and your claim value is zero. However, when you win a challenge as the attacking player, choose and kill a lord or lady character controlled by the losing opponent. Any player may initiate this ability. Um, you can only have four cards at the end of the turn as well. So it's a very, very risky thing to actually just have as um, a scheme because anyone, uh, as a plot in general, because anyone can use it. Um, however, the fact that uh, any time you win uh, a challenge, you can kill a lord or lady, um, that's amazing. Um, I can I already have this in my Lannister deck because I have a Reigns of Castamere deck, which allows me to keep schemes separate. Um, and I basically trot out this. I would basically trot this scheme out uh, when I was not the first player, so that everyone else is gone and only I get to use its benefits. Um, I would, yeah, so the, uh, this is definitely a powerful card um, if you use it correctly. So um, that's the end of this unboxing of this chapter pack. I hope that's been interesting and of use to you. If you enjoyed this video and you came to it via YouTube itself, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Uh, there will be a link in the description below to the article that accompanies this video. If you came to this video via the article, thanks for coming and watching. And don't forget to visit me again. Bye for now.